Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad to be in the same room with all of you. I know we are all uh, wishing we could be in person for incredible presentations and interactions like this, but nonetheless, we are so glad that you are here um, to participate in Georgia Bird Fest. So for those of you who may not know, um, from April 16th to, or excuse me, April 17th to May 16th is Georgia's Georgia Audubon's Georgia Bird Fest, and we've got a combination of in-person trips, socially distanced and masked and outdoors, as well as virtual programs like tonight's program um, with Meg Ford from Alabama Audubon, who we're so excited to have with us today. Um, so do feel free to visit our website and check out the Bird Fest events that we have going on for the rest of the month. Um, there are several that, as I said, that are in-person, as well as uh, virtual and we've got some for the kids so feel free to check out those events i just put a link in the chat for your information so do feel free to check that out and just to let you know this week as far as webinars go um tomorrow we have bird trivia so feel free to register for that on our website and then on thursday we have a panel discussion um, with folks like drew lanham rashina fountain isaiah scott and timothy joe and we're going to be talking about black art and the hope and the liberation that it's brought to, to the world, um, especially in a time like this. So I'm really excited to be able to speak with them and share all of that with you. Um, and then finally, if you have not become a member of Georgia Audubon and you are in the great state of Georgia, we would definitely encourage you to consider becoming a member to take advantage of all the great member benefits um, that you can again find on our website. So do feel free to check that out. Um, all right, so without further ado, I would love to introduce uh, this incredible, incredible woman, Meg Ford, who is at this point a faraway friend of mine because unfortunately we didn't meet in a pandemic, but a, a dynamic woman. Um, she is a native of Birmingham, Alabama, and she has found solace, heritage, creative inspiration, and community in the natural world of her home state. Um, after working as an environmental educator with Ruffner Mountain Nature Preserve, and McDowell Environmental Center, she discovered a love for the intersections between conservation and community coordination, uh, which she continues to build upon in her current work with Alabama Audubon. As the Black Belt Coordinator, she works to highlight the numerous birding and conservation research opportunities that Alabama's historic Black Belt region has to offer while bringing the economic and environmental benefits of bird-based ecotourism to one of the country's most economically challenged rural areas. And so um, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce you all to Meg Ford. So I'll pass the mic over to her. Thank you so much, Karina. That was so nice. So um, as Karina said, we met during the pandemic, unfortunately. I really am excited to see you in person, hopefully sometime soon, so you can go birding. Maybe we can go birding in the Black Belt of Alabama. Um, and also, I'm just so excited to see so many people here at Georgia's Bird Fest that are really interested potentially in coming to visit here. So um, without further ado, let me share my screen and we will get started. Let's see, okay. I don't think we needed that. Hmm. Okay, so like Karina said, um, my name is Meg Ford and I am Alabama Audubon's Black Belt Coordinator. So um, before I get started talking about the Black Belt, I wanted to just give a little bit of an overview on Alabama Audubon in general and then talk about um, some things that we have coming up um, throughout our full organization. So we were founded in 1946. Um, we're gonna be, we are 75 years old. As a matter of fact, our birthday just passed recently. So we're 75. And we were originally founded as the Birmingham Audubon Society because our um, only office of operation was in Birmingham, Alabama. So in uh, 2017, we actually opened up our new office in Mobile, uh, which is an office that focuses on Southern birds of our state and our coastal birds of our state as well. And then just last year, we opened up our Black Belt office, which once again is where I work. So we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We're an affiliated chapter of the National Audubon Society, but we operate as our own separate nonprofit. And just like Georgia Audubon, we're all about native birds and the people that love them. So we highlight bird habitat and bird con conservation needs through things like field trips, indoor classes, in-person classes, um, research opportunities, and outreach. 
So speaking of outreach, I just wanted to highlight a couple of digital opportunities that we have coming up that anyone is welcome to join us from, from anywhere. Um, we have a lot of good luck with doing digital birding opportunities um, and digital classes since the pandemic started because we decided to not do any in-person programs. We haven't done any in-person programs since March of last year. But the cool thing about these digital offerings is that you can join us from anywhere. So here are a few that you can join us for that are coming up in the next couple of months. So our spring Audubon talk is this Thursday, April 22nd from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Our coastal biologist, Sabrina Cobb, she works in our mobile office that I mentioned earlier, is going to be doing a talk about climate change and how that affects the birds of the coast in particular. So you can join us for that for free on Thursday. You just have to register for it. So go to our website at aoaudubon.org slash events to do that. Uh, we also have a bird journaling demo with Timothy Joe um, coming up. I think Karina may have mentioned that Timothy is also joining you all for something for BirdFest this year as well. So he's a really wonderful visual artist that's based in New Bern, Alabama. And he's going to be doing kind of like a Bob Ross art tutorial kind of situation, which I'm really excited for. So um, he's going to be telling us all about how to do um, in plain air journaling on April 26th. That's another one that you can join us for free. You just have to register for it. And then lastly, um, we're going to be doing a Birding by Habitat series that's going to be happening on Mondays in June with our um, with our adjunct staff, Greg Harbor, who's a professor at UAB in um, Birmingham. So those are gonna be on Mondays in June from six o'clock to eight o'clock. That is a paid class, but if you, for whatever reason, have any financial restrictions or just you need to do it for free, you can email our programs assistant, Teresa Rumor at Teresa at alaudubon.org and we'll get you on there for free. And then one day <laughs> we'll get back to doing our in-person classes. So we also do field trip opportunities all over the state um, from our Birmingham office in the north to our Mobile office in the south on the coast and now in our eventually in our Black Belt office right here in the middle. So please stay tuned out for those. We would love to have you come explore the wonderful biodiversity and all the great habitats that Alabama has to offer. So that brings me to the whole point of this talk, which is that you should come and visit the Black Belt to go birding at your earliest convenience. I love this place. Um, it is full of wonderful birds to be able to go see and all these really great diverse habitats. So you can go see a lot of different types of birds in one trip, but it's also got this really wonderful, rich history and a very important culture. Not only um, important to the state of Alabama, but I think important to the entire country. So to kind of um, tell you a little bit about why we decided to set up our office in Greensboro, Alabama in particular, and why we've chosen to start our Black Belt Birding Initiative project. Back up and um, kind of talk about it from the beginning. So Alabama's Black Belt region is a part of a greater Black Belt region that um, spans across the southeast of the United States. So it's um, highlighted in this state, in this um, country map that I have um, on the screen right now. And as you can see, this shape land that doesn't quite um, include the coast. It um, almost hugs the coastline, but doesn't include any of the um, coastline within it. And in this shape, you can kind of figure out, or there's a little bit of a clue at least, as to how the Black Belt came to be, this full region of the Black Belt. So back in the Cretaceous period, which was about 66 million years ago, um, this region of our country was actually totally underwater. It was covered in a warm, shallow sea. So um, when I talked about this time period with my students, because I think that's um, something that tends to blow the minds of adults too, but when I've worked with kids, it's always really fun to say like Alabama was underwater at one point, you know, maybe the part of Alabama that you're living in was totally underwater at one point. So um, when I'm doing that with kids, I kind of like to describe it. So, you know, it's warm, it's humid, maybe a lot like Alabama right now during the summers. And there would have been really tall tropical plants maybe reaching out of the shallower parts of this sea. And then also sea creatures. So um, when you're going 
Fossil hunting, for instance, is another really great thing that you can do in Hale County and in the Black Belt of Alabama, in addition to birding. There's a lot of really great fossil hunting opportunities. And the fossils that you find here are all of sea creatures. So um, some really big ones, like some surprisingly large ones, but also a lot of really small ones that may have had like um, an exoskeleton on the outside of them. So when these creatures died, their remains and their skeletons and their um, exoskeletons would fall to the bottom of this warm, shallow sea and over time were washed over with dirt and the receding sea and all of that formed this warm pressure on those skeletal remains, which created chalk. So the chalk is actually the reason that the black belt is the way that it is because the defining feature of the black belt is rich, dark, fertile topsoil. And the reason that the soil is that way is because of the chalk that's underneath it. There's a really famous um, outcrop of, uh, or not an outcrop, but a really famous unit of chalk um, that was discovered in the city of Selma, which is a very important city for Alabama and the nation, which I'll be talking about a little bit more in um, this talk. But you can actually go to Selma and um, go see this group called the Selma Group. Um, if you go stand on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, for instance, in Selma, while you're birding and maybe kind of thinking about all the great things that happened on that bridge, you can look and see outcrops of this chalk from that bridge. You can also visit another nearby city to Selma, maybe about uh, 45 minutes to an hour away, um, a city called Demopolis. They have a feature there called White Bluff, and that is yet another outcropping of this Selma group that you can visually see from there. And White Bluff is kind of an important part of culture in Demopolis. Um, their Christmas on the River event, which is kind of their big annual festival for the whole city, happens in front of White Bluff. And a lot of other important things happen in front of White Bluff as well. So this warm, shallow sea that created this chalk formation is what gave the Black Belt its distinct defining feature, which is its rich, fertile topsoil. So because of this rich topsoil that we have here in the Black Belt, we have all of these wonderful opportunities to go birding in beautiful habitats that are um, sadly um, shrinking because of development, but also kind of being um, uplifted in other ways as well. I'll try to kind of explain that in just a second. But the uh, defining feature, the defining habitat of the Black Belt is the Black Belt Prairie, which I've got a picture of right here. Um, it's big, wide open spaces with nice, beautiful, tall grasses. Looks like we've got some big blue stem in this picture that I've got um, up here, but also um, things like coneflowers tend to grow in the Black Belt Prairie habitat as well. Um, I actually got to see a really, just a mostly untouched Black Belt Prairie habitat very recently. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Um, even with, I'm from Alabama, I'm just from another place, I'm from Birmingham, and um, just being able to see that habitat in a way that was just totally untouched, and um, not even at a time where all the flowers were blooming, it was very just arresting and beautiful, and um, I can't wait to be able to actually go bird in these habitats and be able to actually see the birds that inhabit these places. So the Black Belt Prairie in particular um, provides great burning opportunities because of the insects that live in them. But there's also things like the um, Talladega National Forest nearby, which has um, hardwood forest and also pine forest in it for some woodland birding. Um, interestingly enough, there's a really big catfish industry here in the Black Belt. Um, on the way, I would say that on the way here from Birmingham, I probably passed by like six catfish farms. There's a lot of them. Um, and that's kind of a recent development for this area. Opportunity to go birding, right? Because there are all of these wading birds and bald eagles and like other birds that like to eat fish that are attracted to these ponds. So if you come birding here, I can promise you that there are going to be a lot of different um, opportunities to go birding and that you're going to see a lot of different types of birds in one trip. So we've got like anhingas, we've got bald eagles, there are bald eagles everywhere. I had never seen a bald eagle before until I moved here. Um, we've got painted buntings and indigo buntings, scissor tail flycatchers, Mississippi kites, scissor tail kites. All sorts of birds um, and just a really, like I said, you can, if you plan your trip out very well, you can go and see a lot of them in one go. 
So this is the part of working here that is a little bittersweet for me because like I said, the rich habitats here and this beautiful land um, provides all these great opportunities to see like new plants that you've never seen before and um, new birds that you maybe have never seen before. But it also has this very specific tie to the social culture of the Black Belt today and also in the past because um, the rich fertile black soil of this area also was great for growing cotton. So Alabama's Black Belt was the heart of cotton slave economy in our state, unfortunately. Um, the statistic that I've read is that 40% of all of our slaves were concentrated in just this one little strip in the middle of our, um, in the middle of our state. And um, so it's the, there's just this weird, um, balance that I think can be needs to be struck for if you're going to go birding here or if you're going to talk about birding here. I think that Alabama Audubon is also obligated to talk about these really important nuggets of history that are tied to the land as well. And also another important thing that we as birders I think could all stand to think about a bit more is the fact that wherever we go birding it's a place that was taken from an indigenous community. So um, the cotton industry in Alabama was no exception, you know, long before the um, Indian Removal Act happened in, I believe, 1840, no, 1830. Um, long before that happened, there were um, battles and um, just these indigenous communities, specifically in Hale County, we'd be talking about Creek communities fighting to be able to keep where they were living, fighting to be able to keep the land that they know works very well, but that white settlers we're wanting a little slice up for themselves. So that's something that's really important for us to also highlight um, when we're talking about taking field trips to the Black Belt or when you're trying, or when you're thinking about visiting the Black Belt, that's something that's very important to kind of acknowledge and keep in mind. And just to kind of give you a little bit of context for how important the cotton industry was in Alabama and also um, our political state of affairs at the time, the original capital of Alabama before it was Montgomery was a city called Old Cahaba. And Old Cahaba is now a ghost town that has an archeological park in it, which you can also go visit when you come birding here. The original capital was at this uh, place called Old Cahaba because of its one proximity in the Black Belt, very close to the cotton economy and because of to the Alabama. The only reason that it was moved to um, the only reason that it was moved to Montgomery was because of the, once again, proximity in the Black Belt and because of its um, closeness to the Alabama River. But in addition to that, Montgomery was also the original capital of the Confederate States of America. So just a little bit of context for, um, for just where we were at the time. I think that I'm having a little bit of lag here, so I apologize if y'all can't hear me. Just um, shoot me a message or <laughs> somebody say something in the chat if, if my uh, video is lagging. I got a little message just then. So um, to continue with a little bit more context about the social history of the Black Belt, um, following the emancipation of slaves in 1863, I think that we may all be familiar with the idea of the Great Migration, which happened around um, immediately afterward, where um, free Black people were moving from the South to the North um, to start new lives and to kind of um, get their footing a little bit better um, with having their new freed lives. But something that I personally in school didn't learn as much about was the fact that a lot of people chose to stay here. And I would imagine that their thought process may have been, I've got this skill in agriculture, maybe now I've got my own little slice of land, so now I'm going to get a little slice of this extremely lucrative cotton industry for myself. And unfortunately for all Black farmers in this area, that was not the case. And um, one of the reasons that I guess no one could have really um, planned for or known about is the boll weevil infestation of 1910. So boll weevils are a weird little bug. I used to have a picture of one on this slide, but I decided to take it off because people were really confused about what it was when I wasn't explaining that it was a bull weevil immediately. But you can Google it. They look really interesting. Um, they're a type of beetle that eats basically every part of a cotton plant. So when the infestation happened in 1910, the response for a lot of farmers, black or white, was to double down and grow more cotton. 
And um, the boll weevils said no and doubled down themselves. So there ended up being twice as many boll weevils and twice as many root and cotton, um, cotton farms. So that was a big downfall of the um, cotton industry in particular. But even if you weren't growing cotton, as we all know, with the end of slavery came the rise of the Jim Crow era. So if you're a Black farmer that was living in the Black Belt, you, even if you had your own slice of land and you had everything going for you, you were still worked against by the local government and by all of these um, restrictions that were put on you. And as we all know now, there's a lot of evidence for this nowadays, but the, um, the inability for people of color in Alabama in particular to be able to be elected cannot be understated. Um, there are, even after people of color got the right to vote, the voting test, um, you can actually Google some of these as well and just see some of them in person, but they would have questions like how many bubbles are in a bar of soap? Things that are just totally impossible to answer and things that you know no real person would know the answer to. So not only could you um, not, you know, not only were you not getting the resources and the help that you needed, but you couldn't even get people that represented you to get the resources and help that you needed. However, um, with all of this um, discrimination and all of the people that have been disenfranchised through the cotton industry here in Alabama, um, there is also a lot to celebrate here. And that's the thing that I really like to lean on, especially with being from Birmingham, which was another city that was pretty big for the civil rights movement. In particular, that's something that I really love to dive into here and something that once we do in-person programs here in the Black Belt, I'm wanting to explore a lot more with our birders. So for instance, before the civil rights movement happened, um, this would have been during World War II, the Tuskegee Airmen were the first Black squadron um, of the U.S. military to be able to fly overseas. And they were educated at Tuskegee Institute, um, which is now Tuskegee University today. Um, and then also just the importance of the Black Belt for the Civil Rights Movement, once again, cannot be understated. I, I get overwhelmed thinking about all of the big stories and little stories that contributed to um, people of color being able to have the right to vote across the nation all happening in this little strip of land here in Alabama. So one that is very important that you may already be familiar with are the Selma to Montgomery marches. They were spurred by the death of Jimmy Lee Jackson, who was a retired pastor and also a um, civil rights um, activist that was from Marion, Alabama. He was killed by a white state trooper during a peaceful protest and his death sparked the um, beginning of the first Selma to Montgomery march which is also known as Bloody Sunday, an, another term that folks on here might already be familiar with. Bloody Sunday was um, not a good day because so many people, of course, were injured and attacked needlessly. Um, that was a protest that began at the foothills of the Edmund Pettus Bridge that I mentioned earlier in Selma, Alabama, where the protesters were met by state troopers and also just volunteers recruited by the state to stop their progress. I don't think, um, from what I understand, there wasn't any specific calls for violence, but that's what they did. Um, most famously, Representative John Lewis was there, a very, very young Representative John Lewis, I think he was 24, um, was present at the uh, very first Selma to Montgomery March Bloody Sunday and had a permanent scar on his head from a skull fracture there. So it's, a horrible day and one that's really tough to talk about, but the great thing about it is that it got all of this wonderful national coverage. And from there, um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed just a few months later. So that was just from the first March. There were three in total and um, they still weren't able to complete the second March to Montgomery, but they were able to complete it on the third attempt. Um, next, Ralph Abernathy was um, kind of Martin Luther King's right-hand man. He was born in Marengo County, once again, here in the Black Belt. So Ralph Abernathy was um, president at all of the marches that Martin Luther King um, organized. And he was also the person that wrapped up the last of Martin Luther King's duties with the SELC, the um, Southern Christian Leadership Conference following his assassination. Once again, somebody from Marengo County. 
And this one, y'all, <laughs> I, I tell people about this um, whenever it is even just mildly applicable to what we're talking about, because I didn't know about this until I moved here. The Lowndes County Freedom Organization was a civil rights organization um, founded in Lowndes County, specifically um, on the on issues surrounding the right to vote for Black people. And um, about a year after their founding, the um, someone from Oakland, California named Huey P. Newton got in touch with the people that founded the Lowndes County Freedom Organization to ask if he could adopt their symbol, which is the Black Panther. So the original iteration of the Black Panther Party was technically from this Black rural community in Alabama. So cool, like it just blew my mind, the fact that I didn't already know about it and that it's not just common knowledge. Absolutely incredible. So on, a, on the same note of that not being common knowledge, there are a lot of just here since I've been living here and kind of exploring the area that I didn't know about. I feel like I learned something new every day. So I picked up on some, I listed right here some big stories and some things that you may already have known about, but um, if you come and visit here, you can probably learn a lot more. So that in a nutshell, <laughs> it's very hard to summarize the Black Bell in one presentation, but that in a nutshell, that intersection between unique ecology and unique habitats and really interesting social history and very important social history is why we decided that starting the Black Belt Burning Initiative was a good idea. We at Alabama Audubon already kind of knew about how great the Black Belt was. We've been taking field trips here with our burning community for decades now. Um, one of our field trip leaders, Greg Harbour, that I mentioned earlier, told me that he went on a field trip with us to the Black Belt in the 80s. So we've been coming here for a long time for us to establish an office here and for Alabama Audubon to hire me, our Black Belt coordinator, to live here and work here permanently is our investment in the Black Belt. So we don't want to just be about burning here and leaving. We want to be able to have a lasting impact and to help local business owners and to help the local community as much as we can while we're here. Alabama Audubon's Black Belt Burning Initiative works to bring the economic and environmental benefits of bird-based ecotourism to one of the country's most economically challenged rural areas. It's um, difficult for me to um, lead sometimes with describing the Black Belt as being economically challenged because I don't want that to be a descriptor for it, but um, the fact of the matter is that there are so many communities here that did not recover from that um, cotton industry that I uh, mentioned earlier and the discrimination that came along with it and the white flight that came along with it. And um, it's very important for us to think about that while we're here. Like I said, we want to be able to support this area economically through birding as much as we can. Through field trips, special events, research partnerships, and national outreach, we're leveraging our organization's expert staff and statewide reach to make a positive difference for Black Belt birds and the people who love them. I'm going to take a break really quick to check on the chat. Let's see. Sorry, y'all. We've got a lot of folks who are just commenting about just connections that they're making in history and, and their own reflections. Um, yeah, so this is Really awesome. We've got some questions that are coming in too that we'll answer at the end. Um, okay. Well. Mm -hmm. Okay. These are really good. Okay. I'm skimming through them right now and they're very, very good. But like, like uh, Karina said, if we're going to get to them at the end, I'll wait. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you all. Feel free to leave me any questions or like, I love those little anecdotes. I think someone said that they have a relative that's from the Black Belt. I love to know about that stuff. So put it in the chat. So um, this is a video that I'm going to share with you all that is from our 2019 Black Belt Birding Tour. And um, it's just a really good overview for the project and some of the wishes and hopes that we have for it. And um, I'll fill in some of the gaps um, after we watch it. <laughs> Welcome. 
welcome to our first ever Black Belt Birding Tour. Everybody ready to see kites? Yeah. Yeah. Ecologically, this region is called the Black Belt Prairie because at one time it was full of big grasslands because the soils were black and rich in the 19th century. And that was both a blessing and a curse because this was the heart of cotton agriculture in the South. It was also the heart of uh, the slave economy. And it really has two different connotations. One's the soil, but it's also where one of the densest African American populations in Alabama. Kind of singing tears. That's indigo hunting thing, isn't It's a well kept secret that I hope will not be a secret much longer. Yeah, I'm here from South Carolina. I drove over just for this, this event, five and a half hours. It's a new landscape and new people. We're bringing an impact to the economy. We just brought 120 people to Greensboro. Most people that live in Birmingham didn't even know the Black Belt existed, and they certainly don't know that it existed. Oh, shoot, surreal. to Greensboro. Most people that live in Birmingham didn't even know the Black Belt existed, and they certainly don't know that it exists to go birding. Partnerships like these with landowners mean that we can get access to uh, the inner parts of properties. First most special thing about the Joe Farm is the Joe family. They're just great people who have welcomed us with open arms. My name is Cornelius Joe. This is our farm. I was raised up here. This is our third generation. And right here, we raise black Angus cows. We do our own hay. Matter of fact, we have a little demonstration set up to get the kite to come out. It means a lot to me that I can take people and bring them to the family land that I've been a part of since I've been born and my father and his father. And we have about six miles of trail. Working with this farm will set an example for how small landowners can bring in a little bit of extra business in the form of ecotourism and work with birders and increase conservation awareness throughout the community. It is actually the first birding trip that I've ever been on. It's just really beautiful and nice to be out in nature. I love it. It's just fantastic to, to be able to connect to the communities, to make it a community effort to help protect their birds. This southern expansion is where it's at. I'm really looking forward to being a part of these efforts that Audubon is making to bring nature and culture together. Sorry that I started it over by accident. <laughs> I guess I'm not very tech savvy, but so that, like I said, was a video from our 2019 Black Belt birding tour. We would normally do one every year, but of course last year we weren't able to do it, um, but we're gonna hopefully come back and do one very strongly um, this year, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But that's kind of the gist of the Black Belt Birding Initiative. We want to be able to connect with landowners and we want to be able to connect with the local community here to be able to support them through birding and ecotourism. So off the bat, um, the stars of that video were the Joe Farm and the Joe family and their ecotourism business, which is called Connecting with Birds and Nature Tours, LLC. So the Joes are Black Angus farmers. Um, Chris Joe, who's I believe the youngest of the Joe family, um, he is a third generation Black Angus farmer and his dad um, currently runs their Black Angus farm um, called the Joe Farm. So they noticed at one point that there were birders that were stopping to watch their field while they were cutting grass. Because when they cut the grass, um, the insects that things like scissor tail kites, baby kites, and things like that like end up coming out and then swooping down to get those uh, insects and giving any birders that are watching a really good view and a really good um, spot for those birds or even photographers and things like that. 
so they noticed that there were birders just kind of pulling up on the side of their farm and doing that. And they thought, well, why not make this a business, which I absolutely love. So if you all want to book a tour with the Joe Farm, they're doing incredible things. Um, and they have group tours periodically. I think they have them seasonally. And they also offer um, private tours that you can kind of book on a person by person basis. But I heard that they're actually booked through May. So you're going to have to schedule a little bit farther out because they're very popular and they're doing incredible stuff. Like I said, they've gotten really great national coverage recently. They were in USA Today. Um, they've been in our, all of our local papers and they're doing incredible things. So um, please support them. Please book a tour with them. And then um, they are also just a really wonderful, shining example of what other landowners in the Black Belt can do. You know, if they're interested in getting a little bit of extra income from their um, farmland, whether that's um, agricultural farming or, um, or um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, far, um, animal farming, they can potentially talk to us about how they can make um, their birding habitats a little more lucrative for birds, maybe get some consultations from us on um, native plantings. And, you know, even if you don't want to do what the Joe Farm is doing and have a whole business for it, maybe you're just interested in like seeing more birds on your bird habitat. We're also into that too. So forming these land partnerships, I would say, is kind of the foundation for all of this that we're doing in the Black Belt. Um, once again, that's the Joe Farm. Please go look them up. They're amazing. One of the first things that I did um, with starting with the Black Belt Birding Initiative and when I moved to Greensboro in particular is this project that we're doing at Perry Lakes Park. So Perry Lakes Park is a um, natural space in Perry County. So not in Greensboro. Um, it's maybe about a 30 minute drive for me. It's a space that has hiking trails through a lot of old growth forest so that you can see some really cool old trees there. And then they also have an oxbow lake and a bald cypress swamp that you can go canoeing in. And once again, um, oh, and they also have a beach. They have a beach that um, connects with the Copper River, so it's a pebble beach. Um, but once again, these are all really great, cool opportunities to go birding. So that was three habitats that I mentioned that you can go explore in one trip to this one park. And it's a park that's used, from what I understand, by locals, but it's also pretty widely used by people from out of state. Um, so the people <laughs> that I talk to will say that, like, when they visit, it's mostly people that aren't from Alabama. Their license plates say that they're from out of state for the most part, because this is a really, really good birding spot and a really popular one. However, um, as I mentioned, a lot of the areas in the Black Belt are economically challenged and Perry County is one of the most hard hit ones in particular. So this park unfortunately is closed right now because the county is unable to uphold the maintenance to ensure that it's safe at all times for all of their visitors. So they made the decision to close it last year. So Alabama Audubon and a few other nonprofits in Alabama studio who also built a lot of the great structures out there. They built a- Meg? Yes. Sorry, you, you cut out for a second. Could you start over from after you said a bunch of um, nonprofits got together? Oh, sure, thank you. Yeah, thanks yeah. for that heads up. So um, a bunch of nonprofits got together, including Alabama Audubon. And those, oh no, my, <laughs> I'm getting that message again. I'm going to start over one more time. <laughs> a bunch of nonprofits got together, <laughs> Alabama Audubon, including Cahaba River Society, Alabama Burning Trails, Auburn Rural Studio, which is an offshoot of Auburn University. They built the burning tower that's there. It's supposed to be the tallest one in the Southeast and um, the Nature Conservancy in Alabama. So we're all kind of working together to pull together our volunteer base and to pull together um, any funding that we can come up with in order to get the park reopened. Because like we said, it's just a really beautiful space. It can be a really great boon for the community, for people that want to exercise and get some fresh air and see some nature. But it's also really good for us nerds. You know, even if, <laughs> if you really like birds, this is a really, really great spot for you to go visit. So we're going to try to do our best to get that to assist the county in getting that space reopened. And then not long after I moved, we got our Black Belt office opened. 
So we opened up our office in October. I'm the only person that works in it right now and I have a really beautiful space to work in. Our office building is a former Rosenwald school. So the Rosenwald schools were a series of about 5,000 schools that were built by Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald, who was the president of Sears Roebuck and Company. Um, they built these schools as a direct um, response to the underfunding of Black schools um, in the time of the Jim Crow era where um, schools were still segregated, right? So the Rosenwald schools were supposed to be an opportunity for Black students to be able to get the same quality of education that a white student might. So that's what our building is. It's a former Rosenwald school. And um, it's the outside of it is totally the same as before. Even like the weird little cool dimpled windows are the same as they were when the school was built. But the inside's been totally gutted out and um, renovated. So I've got my office in there. Um, if you find yourself in the Greensboro area, when you go birding in the black belt, please feel free to swing by and say, hey. And then I can give you some recommendations for food nearby or lodging or whatever you need and or more places to go birding as well. Um, my landlord who owns this building and also works in this building is with an organization in Greensboro called HERO. They are the Hale Empowerment Revitalization Organization and they provide um, affordable housing for people and affordable workspaces for folks and they also do a lot of really important work in this area for bill assistance for folks as well. So it's a really cool honor to be working with them and I work with a baker. There's a baker that works in my building that bakes Egyptian goods named Abadir's Bakery. So it always smells amazing. So little brag, little humble brag on my really cool workspace. So y'all, please, if you're ever in the area, please feel free to come by and say, hey, you can take a picture in front of that mural of the Mississippi kite that I'm standing in front of right there. And not long after we opened up our office, we, I got the really incredible opportunity to host a panel talk discussion called Black Birders in the Deep South. This is something that is very important to the Black Belt Birding Initiative, considering that the Black Belt is about 60% people of color. So if we're going to do this right, and we're going to have a totally open doors and really diversify our birding community, um, having a discussion like this was very important because we were discussing things like what are the specific needs for more diverse birding communities in general, but like the Black Belt. Well, so, you pause for a second there. Sorry, after you said birding communities in general, could you pick up from there? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh, did I cut out again? Yes, yes, <laughs> but we can hear you now. <laughs> Great. I'm doing this from home and just another fun fact about the Black Belt, our um, internet, our internet options are a little limited. So <laughs> apologies for that. So no let's see, where did I leave off on? It's a, it was just a really important talk to have about um, diversifying our birding communities in general, but specifically um, for how do you diversify birding communities in a place that's deeply Southern and deeply rural, like the Black Belt, for instance. So Karina was really amazing and she participated in that for us, but also um, Dr. Drew Lannon did, who I believe also um, Karina mentioned partnering with you all for BirdFest. Christopher Joe, who I have already bragged so much during this talk, but I'm going to brag on him so much, some more. Um, he was able to contribute a lot to this talk as well, just as someone that owns a Black-owned ecotourism business. And he talks a little bit about Dr. Rashida Farid is a wildlife ecologist for Tuskegee University, and she also, once again, was someone that grew up in the Black Belt and had a lot of really incredible pers the perspective on, um, on diversifying burning communities in the Deep South. I want to wait a second. Is it fading a little bit? Okay. And then Christian Cooper was our last guest. Um, is a board member for New York City one, but you may know that bird that unfortunately had the police called on him while he was birding in Central Park. And um, it was interesting to have him on as well, and Karina too, because as folks that aren't from the South, you're able to kind of dive into those questions that someone that's not from the South may have about birding in places like Alabama. So that was just a really incredible thing to do as like one of my first projects here.
got me set up on I, what I think is going to be the correct path going forward, I felt, um, which is just radical inclusion and unconditional love for everyone that wants to join us in our birding endeavors, no matter where you are. Meg, you may have to uh, pause your video <laughs> just to let up some bandwidth, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Sorry, we love seeing your face. but <laughs> No, I completely understand. Okay. <laughs> How's that? Maybe we'll learn? Okay. Well, I hope it is. I'm going to keep going. Yes, you're but good. But Karina, yes. just, um, just pause me again if it... Um, if I need to go back and say anything, you're being really helpful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so the last thing that I think I'll leave off on the Black Belt Birding Initiative are that, of course, are going to be having research opportunities here in the Black Belt. So we have a lot of research opportunities that are um, community-based that we already have established in our Birmingham and Mobile locations. Those two are our Chimney Swift program and our Heron program. So we have a Heron, we have a program that's specifically about monitoring green heron and yellow crowned night heron populations. We can definitely bring here to the Black Belt. We have all of those birds here. But then the magical thing is that there are all of these other birds that we haven't gotten a chance to explore yet here in the Black Belt. Like I said, there are all of these um, unique habitats here and the unique ecology once again just allows for really unique birding opportunities. So for instance, um, fun fact, this bird that I have pictured here is a scissor tail flycatcher, one that was taken at the Joe farm probably while they were mowing the grass. And um, it is a bird that if you google the range map for it right now, it doesn't even show up as being in Alabama at all, <laughs> which is insane because the scissor tail flycatcher on the Joe farm I know is like a bread and butter kind of thing for them, you know. They time it out and they know when the scissor tail flycatchers are going to be here, so they're definitely here in the black belt, but the research hasn't been done yet to show that they are. So the research component of this is something that I'm very excited to explore more with our conservation department. I think that we're going to be able to, if not um, just uncover some really interesting things. I think we're going to be able to uncover some things that are going to be important for the burning world on a national scale as well. So with all of that said, I also wanted to just bring up a few things that we have coming up very, very soon. Um, one that I've been having a lot of fun with building out with Alabama Audubon is our Birders Flock Here program. It's going to be a little bit like TripAdvisor. So if you go on a trip to go birding in the Black Belt, you will be able to go to our Birders Flock Here page on our website. And for instance, if you wanted to go birding in Hale County, you could click on our Hale County tab and Birders Flock Here and find a list of local lodging that you can support. You can find local restaurants that you can go eat at while you're here. You can find um, other tourist attractions that you can check out and other places to go birding. And you can find other um, makers and other places that you can go shop in when you're here in Hale County. Because once again, I think that it can't be understated that it's very important when you go and visit these communities here that you try to leave a positive impact before you leave. You know, don't just come in and bird for the day and then leave. You know, if you have the time and you have the resources, really, you know, do it up. You can, um, like I said, stay overnight, support some local lodging, go get some really delicious barbecue, <laughs> go get a nice cup of coffee from the stable, things like that, okay? So um, once we've got that open, or even before you have, we have that open, you wanna email me to get some um, insight on uh, places that you can support while you're traveling, let me know. And then finally, very excited to announce this, um, we are going to be hosting a Black Belt Birding Festival in Greensboro, Alabama on August 7th. So this will be an all-day opportunity to do field trips in various habitats around Hale County and around our um, main city, Greensboro, but also some opportunities for indoor sessions on Greensboro culture. We're going to have the Safe House Black History Museum come and talk about voting rights history in the area. We're going to have Moundville Archaeological Park come and talk about Indigenous history in the area. And Dr. Drew Lanham is actually going to be our keynote speaker for it. So it's going to be a really great day um, to 
just be outside in the hot Alabama heat. It's going to be August. I'll bring your water. <laughs> but it'll be a really great day for black belt bird exploration, um, opportunities to learn a little bit more about our culture, and also ample opportunities to support local businesses because we'll have a vendor expo as well. So hope to see you all there. And then I, um, this slide is just a little slide of extra little bonus content that you can look through if you want to learn a little bit more about any of the things that I discussed today in concerning ecology or history in the Black Belt, because I can't say enough, this is, I've just moved here. I'm from Birmingham and I've been living here since October and I'm still learning. So these are some um, resources and some books and some websites and things like that, that I've gotten a lot of good insight from since moving. Southern Wonder by Scott Duncan is an incredible book. <laughs> Even before I moved here, I knew about how helpful this book is. If you're wanting to learn about Alabama's biodiversity in any way, in any part of the state, you should definitely go check out that book. Um, the Ecology and Conservation of Black Belt Prairies is a paper by Claude Jenkins, who works for the Alabama Wildlife Federation. It dives into the ecology of the Black Belt, specifically in terms of our Black Belt Prairie habitats. Um, and if you want to get a copy of that, I can give you Claude's email. I don't think you can find that on Google or anything like that. Um, the Safe House Black History Museum is a wonderful resource. You should definitely go visit if you're um, <clears throat> in the Greensboro area to go birding, learn a little bit about voting rights history and the history of slavery in this area, and then, um, you know, have a little bit of a deeper appreciation for the habitats of the area um, while you Meg, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh -huh. you dropped out for for a second there. Okay, thank you. Priya, I'm so sorry about this. No, don't apologize. Okay, I think I'm good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the Taurus Selma app by AC Reeves. AC is a wonderful person. She owns a few Airbnbs in the Selma area, so you can sit hit her up. She's also a wonderful visual artist and has a studio if you want to go check out some local art. Um, but the Tourist Selma app is um, basically a self-guided tour on the Black history aspects of, of the Selma. Yeah. And then, of course, I haven't been to the Legacy Museum since um, the pandemic hit, but it's a really great resource in Montgomery for learning about Black history throughout the state of Alabama. And I believe that they're open now for socially distanced um, visits. So check them out, too. If you want some context for the Black Belt right now, um, Visions of the Black Belt is a picture book and kind of a cultural um, resource for learning about things like Black Belt music and Black Belt food, um, Black Belt art. So that's a really good book to check out if you want to learn a little bit about um, the cultural side of things. Waste is a very good book by Katherine Coleman Flowers. She is a recent um, MacArthur Grant recipient. And she's from Lowndes County, which um, has a slew of um, environmental injustice issues. Once again, stemming from that history that I mentioned earlier and the um, economy of the, of the cotton industry. And um, it's just a really good insight into what it's like growing up in Lowndes County and what it's like growing up in Black Belt. And she goes through all of her um, work that she's done outside of the state and why she um, came back to Lowndes County to work on this particular project. So definitely check that one out. Uniontown is a short film that's about, once again, another environmental injustice that's happening right now in the city of Uniontown. Um, definitely go check that one out. I'm just going to leave that one there. You should definitely just go check that one out for yourself. And then Hale County this morning, this evening, once again, I don't think I'm going to dive into too terribly much. It's a really beautiful and very honest and very raw portrait of one day in Hale County. So a little bit of insight on the Black Belt right now. And um, I'll, I'll I'll quickly go over these birding resources. Y'all may not need them because you're um, Georgia Audubon folks, but if you have not tried birding before, the Audubon ID app is a really good one. It talks you through the steps of how to, how to ID a bird and like the things to look out for when you're IDing a bird. So that's a good one if you're a beginner. Once you get your birding skills up and you visit Alabama, you should join us on eBird. So you can record all of your birding sightings in the Black Belt for us on eBird. Um, we recommend the Field Guide to the Birds in North America by Nat Geo for a printout book. You know, if you don't want an app <laughs> and you just want something that you can hold and flip through, that's a really good one to check out. 
And even though I really would love for you to visit us in the Black Belt, obviously, you don't have to travel anywhere to go birding. You can go birding wherever you are, and you don't need to buy any special equipment, including binoculars. So if you want to learn anything more about Alabama Audubon or our Black Belt project, you can go to alaudubon.org slash Black Belt. Or if you want to connect with me, you can email me at meg at alaudubon.org. And that's it. Meg, that was incredible. Thank you so much. I have to tell you, I was crying when you were playing that video from the festival from a couple of years ago. I just, because that's what conservation looks like. That's what it should look like. You yeah. know what I mean? It just was to actually see that manifested in the flesh, like that happening in real life was like, it, it just, it, it blew me away. Um, I do really quickly want to get to the, a, a few of the questions that are in the Q&A um, before folks have to run. Um, but someone asked, uh, Veronica asked, is ecotourism, uh, like bird watching, for solo travel easy to do around Alabama? Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Um, you know, I've, yes, I would definitely say so. Um, obviously, if you're going to go to like a larger city, like for instance, Birmingham is one of the bigger cities in Alabama. If you go there, it's going to be really easy to find like accommodating food and lodging and things like that. Um, but if you were to travel to Greensboro, for instance, like I can give you a little short list of um, small Airbnbs and small beds and breakfasts that you can go check out. But like options for that are a little more limited depending on where you go in Alabama. Gotcha. Awesome, thank you. Um, Karen asks, uh, I'll be passing through Alabama in the summer and have two days to bird around Montgomery and two days around Mobile. Um, where should I bird? Okay, so um, I'm gonna actually direct you to our um, coastal office for the Mobile needs. Um, I haven't had a ton of opportunities to go birding in Mobile in particular. I know that the Bon Secours National Wildlife Refuge isn't that far of a drive from Mobile. Um, and that's a really beautiful like natural area that's right by the coast that you can check out some coastal birding in. And honestly, I hate to say it for Montgomery, I actually don't have a ton of recommendations either just because I just moved here and I haven't really had a chance to travel that much because of the pandemic. Um, but if you shoot me an email, I will find out for you and I will tell you through email. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Would you mind throwing your email in the chat if, if you have a, a second, just so folks can copy and paste. Um, yeah. Meg is a, a, the work that, that Meg is doing is incredible and is such a, has so much to offer. So again, definitely feel free to, uh, to reach out to her if you have questions. Um, and then lastly, Jan asked, what is the best time of year to visit to see a painted bunting? Painted buntings are going to be here in the late summer and early fall. So coming up kind of soon, you know, maybe if you came in like July, that might be on the early end of it. Or if you came in like October, that might be on the later end of it for painted buntings. Nice. Perfect. And if you're in Georgia, if you ever get to go down to Jekyll Island, there is just like an abundance of painted buntings down there, especially in the spring and summer. So like I would highly, I mean, they were everywhere, just falling off the trees. So um, if you have the chance, you can also see it in, uh, in Georgia too. So definitely feel free to check it out. Um, well, that brings us right to eight o'clock. Um, there were so many just comments of just appreciation and for, for the intersectional story that you told us today about what the Black Belt is who's there and what's happened and what is happening now. Um, Meg, this was I, the, the most emotional presentation that I've ever been part of. So thank you so much. We are all so grateful. Um, again, y'all just, just give uh, Meg your appreciation in the chat. We're so glad uh, that you're able to join us. And this presentation was recorded. Um, so we will be posting this presentation publicly on YouTube so that you can go back and take a look at it. If you have any uh, information that you want to go back and check in on or watch that beautiful video again, I will be doing that. Um, but again, Meg, thank you so much for, for giving of your time and sharing your story. Um, and we look forward to going to visit the Black Belt and hanging out with Alabama Audubon. Awesome. Thanks so much, y'all. Thanks for having me. All righty. Well, we will see you all later at our bird fest and hopefully someday soon in Alabama. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Bye everyone.